All right, so welcome to our first lecture. So now this is about an introduction to self-adjusting networks. And in particular, you will learn about what is a self-adjusting network and then what's the empirical motivation behind them and also what are the technological enablers. And um, then we also start to understand some of the relationships between uh, self-adjusting networks and related topics in coding and uh, data structure theory. And finally, we're going to have a, a discussion of the different challenges that self-adjusting networks face. So let's get started. Um, as a motivation, uh, all of us, uh, even today, probably use the various data-centric applications already uh, related to science, uh, social networking, um, entertainment, um, streaming, etc. And most of these applications are actually running in data centers that are becoming hyperscale. So this is one of the big data centers we have, but actually there are even bigger ones in the, in the world. And those data centers, they have hundred thousands of servers and um, basically the interconnecting network of those servers is becoming a critical infrastructure of our digital society because traffic is growing explosively, especially inside data centers, but also to and from data centers. So the problem that we are currently facing is that the network equipment is reaching capacity limits. So we have transistor density rates that are stalling, power density rates that are stalling, and people call this the end of uh, Moore's law in, in networking. And the consequence is that we will have uh, more and more equipment and we need larger and larger networks. And this can be quite uh, resource intensive and become inefficient. And that's very annoying for companies, but now researchers are starting to uh, explore alternative uh, architectures that we are going to uh, discuss in this course. So what's the root cause behind uh, these inefficiencies? So if you look at the basic data center, uh, for example, typically we have a set of servers, a set of racks, and then the question is how to interconnect those. And there are many different ways that data centers are interconnected uh, today and uh, many different flavors, but all of them have in common that they are fixed and oblivious to the actual traffic demand. And um, we argue that this is one of the uh, causes of inefficiencies because you can think of it like uh, building a highway which ignores the actual traffic. So this can be very frustrating. If you're here on the right, you're in the traffic jam and uh, on the left there will be a lot of capacity available. It would be much better if you could also use some of that uh, infrastructure, some of these resources and maybe in the evening the other way around. So uh, making it more demand aware could be uh, potentially very useful. So the vision behind the self-adjusting networks is to make the networks more flexible and demand aware. Right? So you can imagine, for example, you have a data center, again with the racks at the bottom, and then you have at the ceiling, you have a mirrors. Okay? So actually that's one of the technologies that has been built at the MIT. And um, this allows you to have a um, flexible interconnect by having lasers from the racks pointing to the mirrors. So for example, if you have a demand matrix like where one communicates to five, two to six, uh, three to seven, and four to eight. You may want to interconnect it in a way that one is directly connected to five, two to six, three to seven, etc., so that the interconnecting topology matches the demand. So maybe later the demand changes so that one is communicating to two, three to four, five to six, etc., and then again you want to interconnect the rack so that it matches the demand. So one is directly connected to two, three to four, etc. And that's what we call self-adjusting networks, so networks where the topology matches the corresponding demand. The empirical motivation behind this um, technology is that um, there is a lot of structure in the traffic traces. So studies at Facebook and the Microsoft, they show that traffic is uh, sparse and skewed. So traffic matrices have a lot of structure and traffic is also very bursty over time. And the hypothesis here is that this can be exploited for uh, optimization. So recently a uh, methodology has been proposed to actually um, visualize the structure that there is in uh, traffic and especially in uh, traffic traces. It's called the complexity map. So typical applications to have in data centers are databases, web front ends, batch processing applications, machine learning, etc. 
And this complexity map approach allow you to basically see what type of structure is in this application. So uh, in this map, you have a x-axis that shows the temporal structure, or uh, the inverse of it is the temporal complexity. And uh, on the y-axis, you see the non-temporal structure, so it's like the spatial structure. And one thing to observe is that none of these applications are actually uniform. So they actually all have a lot of structure, but different applications have different structures. And that's um, the main or one of the main motivations behind uh, building such networks. Uh, this may sound crazy, uh, but actually there is enabling technology to make uh, such self-adjusting networks. And it's related to photonics. So photonics is one of the key enabling technologies for future prosperity considered both in the US as well as in the in the Europe and um, there is also this saying that um, in the research council there's this saying that the photons are the new electrons so there's a lot of uh, hope in this new technology and specifically in our case the enablers are um, optical switches reconfigurable optical switches that are based on uh, photonic technology. Uh, there is a lot of different prototypes, a whole spectrum. Um, we are not going to go into details in this course. Uh, if you are interested in these technologies, um, have a look at the SICOM workshop OPSIS that is held uh, every year and uh, different uh, research groups present different technologies there. So um, I just want to show you two um, concrete technologies a little bit in more detail. One is the optical circuit switch uh, that allows for rapid adaption of the physical layer uh, and is based on mirrors that can rotate. Okay, so this is an uh, OCS switch. And um, if you have a light coming in from this lower port, then um, currently if it's configured like this, it will be reflected here and then like that and it exits at the upper port. So now if um, you rotate the mirror in this OCS uh, like that, if light come in like this, then it goes up there. It will be reflected like this. And actually now it goes out at the middle port. So uh, by changing the orientation of the mirrors, the light will go in a different path and actually provide a different interconnect. There's also another uh, very interesting technology, just to give a second example, is called Projector. And that's based on digital mirroring devices, DMDs, that uh, basically uh, each micro mirror can be turned on and off uh, programmatically. And you can see basically this as a zero one uh, binary image. And um, basically, for example, the array size here is something like 1000 to 1000 bits. And uh, by changing this on and off pattern, you can uh, influence the direction of the diffracted light and accordingly uh, change the interconnect. So for example, if you have a bitmap like this on the left, then uh, the traffic, sorry, the light will be distributed uh, accordingly in this way on the left. And then if you change the bitmap according to the right figure, then you can see a different distribution and um, you can very quickly change between these um, uh, light propagations. So one challenge here with this technology is that you can only rotate by something like three uh, plus minus three uh, percent. But um, this is uh, something that researchers have been working on to generalize this technology also to reach larger data centers. Um, such reconfigurable optical networks have been around for quite some time. So early proposals date back to something like 15 years ago. Uh, with proposed like Flyways, Helios, and etc. Uh, more recently, um, there is also um, technology by Google and Microsoft, for example, we will see later in the lecture in more detail. Uh, for example, my, uh, Google's Jupyter um, evolving technology, or then Sirius from Microsoft, uh, Cerberus, so that's uh, still a very active uh, field. And if you want to get an overview, there are also surveys on, on uh, these technologies. Um, one maybe interesting aspect to it is that uh, what researchers have noticed that if you change the interconnect by moving the antennas, uh, that can be uh, quite slow because it's um, a slower process than, for example, changing the orientation of a mirror. 
And uh, more recently, for example, in Microsoft's technology Sirius, they have just the switch is just a passive glass, and the connection uh, can be changed by changing the laser uh, color. So this can be a very fast way to reconfigure. So going from moving antennas to moving mirrors to this passive glass technology, you can basically uh, go from microseconds to from milliseconds to microseconds to nanoseconds in, in reconfiguration speed. Um, so the big picture is here. On the one hand, we have this new technology, this flexibility that we get. And then we have these uh, measurement studies showing the structure in the traffic patterns. So putting this together uh, gives the vision of self-adjusting networks. And then hopefully with this adjustment, you can try to improve efficiency, improve performance, or other uh, metrics of, of interest. So this is really uh, the right time to do this, because this technology is just emerging. And in this course, uh, we'll mainly focus on the theoretical foundations, so of demand-aware networks, of self-adjusting uh, networks, and um, also talk about metrics, algorithms, and uh, the foundations of this um, vision. And the position is quite unique. Of course, there are a lot of um, systems currently becoming self-adjusting, so it's a big trend. You can see as recommender systems of Netflix to be self-adjusting um, systems. You can see uh, even algorithmic trading as a self-adjusting system, but you, for example, also have like neural networks that are also adapting based on the data, so it's in their very nature. Um, one difference here to our perspective in this course is that our adjustments are happening in hardware. So um, we are um, making these adjustments, self-adjustments, not in software, but in hardware. Um, one interesting perspective that we'll explore further in this course is related to um, how this technology or this vision relates to other fields. And one interesting way to see this is um, if you compare this to uh, evolving um, theory in the context of data structure. So classically, let's take a binary search tree as a data structure. The goal was um, to have like a balanced binary search tree, and that was the ideal um, data structure that you you're typically consider in this context. But there's also something called the demand-aware binary search tree. So these are binary search trees that are optimized towards the demand. So if you have a distribution, a frequency distribution of keys, if you build a demand-aware binary search tree, um, this can um, be uh, better to improve the access cost in the binary search tree, because then you can keep very frequent keys, you can keep close to the root, and less frequent keys you can do um, lower in the tree. And then there's something called self-adjusting binary search trees, for example, splay trees. These are trees that even adapt their structure to the demand. So if you, for example, now have a certain uh, access pattern, maybe uh, over time this can change. So accordingly, also the binary search tree can change and then uh, basically reduce the access cost further that you have. And very similar uh, optimizations also exist in the context of coding. So if you have a worst case coding, for example, if you uh, want to transmit a set of, um, from an alphabet, some words, then uh, if you do worst case coding, you try to have like, uh, for example, a logarithmic number of bits per letter. So this is the optimal way of doing it. But if you have more information about the data that you want to transmit, like frequency distribution, you can use something like Huffman coding. So with Huffman coding, you can optimize um, the transmission by having shorter codes for uh, letters that are more frequent. Right? So, and then there is something uh, also called the dynamic Huffman coding that uh, allow you to change, again, this um, uh, transmission codes over time that, for example, now if we speak English, uh, maybe some different letters are more frequent than if we do, for example, um, uh, in uh, Hebrew, uh, communication in Hebrew. So if you change the language, you may want to adapt also the coding so that you can get an optimal performance. So uh, the more uh, adaptive and adjustable that you make your um, data structure or your code, uh, typically, the better is the performance. So the more efficient you can communicate, the more efficient you can access uh, items in a, in a data structure. And um, the vision here is that we want to get very similar benefits in the context of networks. 
So if we don't have any information about the communication, the best is we can do is probably doing some kind of um, constant degree expander graph. Um, but the more information we have, we can maybe uh, get some statistics of the communication. Then we can build a network that um, is biased. So basically it is optimized towards this distribution. Or you may even go all the way again to something self-adjusting where the structure changes over time and adapts uh, to the traffic pattern that may also evolve over time. So hopefully we can get very similar benefits like we have in this context of data structures. So that's at least the hope here. And um, we will see that there's actually more, this is more than an analogy. So we can see that in this course that you can take metrics and even algorithmic techniques from the uh, data structures from the coding to also build better networks. So that's the, one of the main insights we want to reveal. So overall, um, this uh, self-adjusting network vision uh, introduces a quite uncharted landscape. So we currently have some good understanding, but it's a very new field and we're just touching upon some of the imp important topics. Um, of course, if you start to change the physical topology, um, this may also have an effect on, for example, how to do the routing, how to do the congestion control. This may affect other layers in the network and um, the technology really brings together a lot of uh, different fields. So it touches on the one end, of course, networking, but it also touches aspects of distributed systems and it also touches, uh, of course, algorithms. And that's what we want to um, study in this course. Uh, maybe as one interesting analogy, maybe some of you know this, there is this uh, golden gate zipper. Uh, going back to this um, analogy we had in the beginning with the traffic, um, of course sometimes the traffic, uh, for example in the morning is a lot of traffic demand in one direction and then in the evening in the very other direction. So on the golden gate bridge they have this uh, solution that the car can change the number of lanes adaptively over the day, so they can really have a demand-aware way of using this uh, bridge resource. All right, so um, that's more or less um, the big picture. Um, and um, we want to basically show you in this course also the potential that we can have with this demand-aware networks and um, also ways to understand when can um, demand-aware networks be good and when is the, the profit may be limited. So we're going to talk about metrics that um, depend on the traffic structure that can tell you how much you can benefit if you make your network demand aware. We're going to learn about algorithms and also we will derive lower bounds and upper bounds. So we'll learn about how much can we hope for at the best, how much um, can we get uh, depending on the data um, structure. And we all, we'll also talk about, for example, uh, in particular about the use case in data centers of this technology. So a lot of the um, aspects that we learn are general, but um, in particular we're interested in data centers. So we're going to talk about hybrid architecture. We'll see later why you want to have like architectures both demand aware and demand oblivious. And we also will complement some of these theoretical uh, discussions with interviews with uh, researchers and also um, practitioners in companies. Um, to give you a complete picture of this vision. And uh, we conclude with this nice uh, figure here, picture uh, or image from uh, a self-adjusting search tree that uh, basically will uh, be an important concept in this course that we see back. So it's some trees that can basically reconfigure themselves um, to optimize. Good, so that um, were our learning goals for today. So um, hopefully you learned uh, the intuition, what is a self-adjusting network. You hopefully learned about this empirical motivation, the technological enablers, and also this relationship to coding and data structure. And uh, in the end, we also had some discussions of how this can affect the other layers, and that um, will be one of the big challenges in this field. Um, there are some uh, references for further reading that are uh, here on the slides as well, so please do have a look uh, at that as well.